those thoughts in your mind because the next after this councillors have spoken on the council panel that we are opportunity to bring forward your comments as well as the questions. So councillors have drawn lots. First it's going to be Jane Corbett, who's a Labour councillor, and the second is yeah, you've got Tom, Tom uh, Crow, the second, he's a Green Councillor, many of you will know these people, and third, it's going to be Richard, Richard Hemp, who's a Lib Dem Councillor. And so they're going to respond to some of the points we've heard tonight, but also talk themselves about how we can work together. Here we have politicians who, we are passionate and angry, as the debt was, um, quite rightly so, about the cuts, but these councillors I know, I'm not a councillor myself, but I do know, as Paul said, are dealing with cuts that are coming down from on high. So we've got to channel our passion to make a difference and think how that can happen. Sometimes it is the decisions that councils have taken that must be challenged. Sometimes the challenge has to go elsewhere if it's going to have effect. So, over to you, Jane, first of all, and uh, what you have to say. Thank you. Just to, just to think back a long time ago, um, I talked to John before, and we were talking about information is power, but we were also talking about understanding structures. And Paul Edwards was brilliant at <coughs> training on that, and understanding communities about the showing that. And Jude, you might forget this, Jude did a, a speaking with confidence course in West Everton, which I was involved in trying to learn how to speak with confidence, in I think it was 1987. So thank you, Jude. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm rubbish, you can blame me. <laughs> And I looked down the list and I saw Liverpool on the list, I thought, oh, okay, so Liverpool, that sounds dramatic. So I remember this little 17-year-old getting off the bus on Enfield Road, if you know Everson, which I represent, <coughs> training Gracie Market, going to Shrewsbury House and helping out the place team. And I was put on the door to take the names. Not a good idea. <laughs> so the first few kids, they, I don't know what they're saying, Diana, actually Diana Atkinson, that was on there. But the thing about that was, roll forward until three years ago, um, and I know, and I knew then, the value of play schemes and the voluntary sector and volunteers in communities just keeping going whatever happens. And in Liverpool, we've had play schemes since I think the early 60s, and probably before that, actually, so we just weren't called play schemes then. So a few years ago, three years ago, um, a few of us, Colin Healy, you know, Colin from LCBS and Kevin Matthew and Ron's Empath, got together and they were saying to me, we've got kids who are very, very hungry in the school holidays. So we hatched a bit of a plan that said, okay, can we basically piggyback onto this fabulous network in Liverpool, get some extra money in there, and call it Play Healthy. So not only is it playing, because that's valuable, but it's also eating together and making meals together, and that's valuable. And we also threw in a bit of welfare rights advice as well. So I'm trying to use what I've learned on the ground and, and feed it into what I'm doing. 1981, um, I was stuck in a tower block uh, with my husband and two little babies, and three, had three pounds a fortnight, couldn't get out. And the corby uh, was atrocious at that stage and wasn't listening. And so a whole gang of us went down and we just basically kicked back but in, a, in a careful way. And one of the things that we learned was Martin Luther King, tough mind, tender heart. If you batter people, they're going to come back. If you actually try and engage with them, they might listen. And also it's much harder for them to get away with it. They don't listen. Um, 86, mid-80s, our little community was nearly wiped out, so we fought back on that together. Again, tough mind, tender heart from Martin. 1992, I found a letter that we wrote from our little West Everton Community Council to Sainsbury's to say, please could we have a supermarket in our area because the mid-80s had almost wiped our community out in terms of population. We're getting our Sainsbury's May next year. So the answer to that is hang on in there, build alliances and keep going. Um, there was also something around local people saying very loudly and clearly, we are getting um, stigmatised and we're getting blamed for being bad parents. So what we said locally was, well, how, how do we deal with that? And people said, okay, what we want is a programme called First Years First, and we do it north to eight, interestingly. So we set that up, and that then became the very first Shore Start in Liverpool, the Emmett Shore Start. Rolling on a few years, and I'm a councillor, and I've got the cabinet member position for children, there you go, Zeth, 
and I'm sitting there cutting the Sure Start budget from 14 million down to 6.9 and further. Roll it back, we need local wisdom on the table, we need local people to have a say, we need the parents and the carers and the children. And I remember, I remember your campaign is that very well, and I'm going to say to you, you've got to come at us. I remember Gordon Brown actually used to say that, you've got to come at us with Make Policy History, and then we have, we have to listen and we have to show. There was a beautiful, um, imagine this, I get a phone call uh, from the mayor's office, from the Rotten Mayor, and say, uh, Jane, there's all your gang in the front, it wasn't Joe saying that, it was one of his office kind of. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's all the shore star people. <laughs> so I came into municipal, and there was, and they were actually from Mossley Hill, which if you're from Mossley Hill, hands up, but it's, it's quite a smart area in quotes. However, Mossley Hill doesn't normally get important campaigns, they did a brilliant campaign, and they had the little ones all dressed up as Father Christmas, and as Joe came round, they said, they started to sing, with Granada reports there, all we want for Christmas is shore star. <laughs> well, if you're the leader of the council, you know, you melt at that point. But what was really powerful was that those children grew up like-minded, in a community that was fighting back in the right way. So I suppose tonight for me is thinking, how do we fight back in the right way? Last story, okay, because we're not going on with it. Last story, Jack, little fella, um, age seven. Um, his mother is very much like a Rosa Parks, but because of her background and her history, uh, she can't be a Rosa Parks in public. So uh, she found her little kid um, basically peeling wallpaper off the, off the wall because he was so hungry at tea time and nothing to eat. Um, she hadn't got anything. Um, so I said to her, how, how are you coping with this yourself and how are your children coping with it emotionally? Because um, the silent scream, someone mentioned the silent scream, did they? I can't remember. Something about silent scream and the problem is it goes inwards. And you can't take a picture of a child who's hungry and say, this child is hungry, because it's just, you can't see it. You, you take a picture of bad housing. So poverty in this country, you can't take an easy picture of it, therefore it doesn't easily get into the papers. So I said to um, the mother, okay, will your little one draw me some pictures because you told me he was really good at art? She said, yes, he will. I said, if it helps him and if we can get him involved in making, making a difference and changing the world around. So he drew me a picture of an empty plate with a knife and fork the other way around, 37. Um, and on the top it said, uh, do you see food? And then there was nothing. Then he did another one, empty plate, smiley face and a sad face. And a sad face, sorry, two sad, two sad faces. South face, above one of them, the plates, had Africa, 2016, or whatever year it was, and then underneath was Liverpool, 2016, and he said, tell Jane this, because I've heard children in Africa are hungry too. Right? Then, and this is a little kid who thought he wasn't worth much, but he is as bright as a button. He wrote me this little quote, which I then use, and it's trying to link it up with, with power, with alliances, and anywhere that we can listen we can take it, I've taken it down to Parliament, um, and it says on it, listen to me, you're grown-ups, this is bad, you are being bad unless you do something with a K about it. So every time I use that quote in that picture, I text his mother who lives off free text, because that's the only thing that she can live off at the moment, we get our money from the council, other people get money from the council, which we're pushing out in shed loads to try and keep people that having enough to eat. But I text it and say, tell Jack, the reason he's called Jack, I said, what's your name? We can't call you for your real name. He said, I want to be called Jack by Jack Spam. Good on you. So I said, every time I use your story, I will text your mum and tell her to tell you that you're getting listened to. And if you remember, last Wednesday, that was part of a motion that Tom and Richard agreed to. And then we can roll out, we're going to write to the government, we're going to write to the UN, we're going to write to the Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jane. Straight over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, so I've been asked to sort of make the positive case for proportional representation tonight. And in doing, before I do that, I'll just respond briefly to some of the previous speakers. So I think the over overview we've had so far kind of reinforces the points I'll try and make. For example, John spoke about the um, anger, the resentment and divides in our society. And I think that kind of underlines some of the stuff I was going to say. And then Lisa made obviously a very impassioned plea for a, a progressive alliance to try to change the electoral system and try and bring this in. So we have an excellent overview there from a national level about the subject. And then from the, from the community panel, it was great to see how these issues are affecting people on the, 
and the grassroots and particularly good to see Jake here because one of the things I'm not going to really go into much detail about but which I think is part of the conversation about electoral reform is votes for younger people, votes for 16 to 17 year olds because I think it's a really important aspect of it. Um, we saw at the Scottish uh, referendum that young people came out and voted in great numbers, they're very engaged with it. And equally, in the EU referendum that we just had, there was pretty, apparently a very high turnout for younger people as well, despite what people say about young people never voting. So I think it's really important to get young people actively involved in talking about politics at a younger age as possible. So, in making the case for um, proportional representation, I'm hoping that um, at this particular time of political turmoil, uh, where we've got an unelected Conservative Prime Minister taking us out of Europe, and uh, the opposition party having a difficult leadership um, struggle, and high levels of distrust and anger among, among the people, it should be possible to make the case for change, and significant change of that. Um, and one reason that it's possible is I think the first past the post system can be shown to be kind of at the root of a lot of our political problems that we have at the moment. So looking at the example of the recent vote to leave the EU, I think a lot of people talk about it being a sort of cry of anger, something as a result of the anger and disillusion that people feel uh, towards politics as usual, and they want to see something different. Um, so one of the reasons people feel left behind under first past the post is because obviously most seats in this country are safe seats, <coughs> so they get basically ignored by the political parties. All the energy at election time is aimed at people in swing seats, and that means that the voice of most people doesn't tend to get listened to and people feel excluded from politics. <coughs> I was talking to my friend from St Helens, his family's all in St Helens and they're all habitual Labour supporters and they have Labour MPs there. But they still feel that as the Labour Party has changed over the years, they feel they haven't been represented for a long time. And they voted to leave almost as a kind of, you know, to, give, you know, to kind of rebel against their own party in a way. And uh, they all feel dead satisfied that for once their vote has actually made a difference and they've actually got something in return for their vote. And so I really think it's a you know, serious cause for concern when people are so unhappy with politics that they're voting against their own parties. If we did have PR, um, every single vote would matter. So politicians, when they're making their appeals, would have to appeal to as many people as they possibly could. Um, and then still, still on the EU referendum, why did we have the EU referendum vote in the first place? Most people will be familiar with you know, the argument that David Cameron needed to do it to keep troublesome backbenchers in check. Um, and obviously it was a massive miscalculation on his part because he wanted us to stay in. But you have to ask, why do people with such different worldviews and such a different idea about what's best for the country have to be in the same party? Well, it's because first past the post forces a kind of two-party system on the country that can only really be two parties of government under this system. So anybody who is ambitious in politics has to join one of those two parties. Most people. We're <laughs> 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 seeing, seeing that same dynamic happening in the Labour Party, of course, with two camps within the same party who have wildly different ideas about what's best for the country. So, you can trace some of the problems we have with down to first past the post. Um, but the main reason that we should have proportional representation on first past the post is because it's just an unbelievably unfair system. The Greens have always had electoral reform as a key policy. But after the 2015 general election result, I thought the time had really come. The Electoral Reform Society said that that was the most disproportionate election that had ever been held in the UK. Um, the Green Party, we more, more than quadrupled our votes and we still only returned one MP. Um, obviously if Caroline leave so she does do the work of 10 MPs, <laughs> still would have liked to get a few more MPs for this massive growth of our, of our votes. And then in, on the other side, the Conservative Party returned 330 MPs, 330 times more than the Green Party. But they actually only got 9.7 times more votes. That just shows you how unreflected the, you know, the MPs are of, of the vote that actually happens. And similarly with the Labour Party, they only got eight times more votes than us, and they've got 232 times more seats. So we really need to sort of change the system to make it actually fair. 
So basically, the result of all this unfairness is that um, all votes are not equal. It means people think there's no point voting for what you believe in. Um, this voting system works against the, any, any plurality in politics, which would better reflect modern Britain. And the end result is the mess that we're, that we're all in. Um, so this brings us to the subject of tonight's meeting, building the Progressive Alliance. Um, as I see it, the purpose of the Alliance would be not to ensure that any one party, party forms, a, forms a government uh, or has a majority, but that there are enough progressive MPs to form a majority and then to uh, basically bring in um, electoral reform so that future elections will be held under a fair system. And I think that would be... Obviously, so I've gone a little bit over there. But obviously that would be an example of politicians showing a bit of maturity, working for something that is for the common good. And uh, I really think this is an important thing that we should all work together to do. And I'll just wrap it up there. But thank you. Without a microphone because it's spluttering the whole time. And it's a fairly small room for a, for a scouser, this, so I'm going to give it uh, a go. And I must say to the people who've organised this, what an excellent format this is. I never watched BBC Question Time. I always believed they should get six members of the public and a hundred MPs and peers <laughs> asking the question. You might make more sense of it. And in a way, that's what you're doing here today. Well, I was asked to talk about working together. I'm going to take that, not just about how we politicians might work together, but how we might work together. And I must tell you that tiny steps are being taken in Liverpool. Joe Anderson and I managed to get through an entire council meeting without shouting at each other. <laughs> and if we can do it, let me tell you that there are opportunities uh, all around. So, how do we form a progressive <coughs> alliance? Well, I think there are two steps that we need to take before we start talking about pacts, alliances, who does what to who and where. The first is we must agree what the scale of the problem is, and indeed what the problems are. Because some things that I see a problem, for example inequality, aren't seen as a problem by some people at all. So I suspect that that's not true of anyone here tonight. But we mustn't assume that because we dislike some things, we're necessarily in favour of the same things. Then we have to ask what it is that we are in favour of. Because there's no point in us working together unless we share certain targets. So I've got six. You start with an absolute belief that everyone has a right to a decent house, a decent education, a decent job and a decent environment. And if you don't believe that, then I suspect that some of us must be in the wrong room. I believe in internationalism, not just Europeanism. I believe in internationalism. This is a world city. Perhaps that's one reason, John, why we voted the way we did. We've always looked outwards rather than inwards. But at the same time, I believe in localism because I believe too many decisions are made outside our boundaries, and we should be making the decisions, not grey men in suits. And I think I'm the only representative of the grey men in suits <laughs> here tonight. Uh, but all the people in a massively devolved system. A belief in envirom environmentalism. Let's not forget, unless we do something in climate change, our successors will not be meeting in this room because the ground floor will be underwater. You'll have to scuba dive up to this road. It's as serious as that. We're not that far from the Mersey here, folks. I believe in an alternative economic system which makes uh, it important for us to use our own money and services more effectively. And I believe that we should be looking at how we deliver services in a much more cooperative, mutual and social enterprise way, because otherwise, in a poor city like this, the money comes in, we put it in the hands of Tesco's, we put it in the hands of an international company, and it ends up in the Turks and Caicos in a tax lover's haven. It doesn't 
have to be that way. And I remember speaking at a conference where people were getting absolutely passionate about the iniquities of the banking system. Lots of nice middle class people. And I asked a simple question. How many of you keep your savings in a credit union? 100 people in the room, three of them were members of the credit union. So that's something that you can do, and it's something that I've done. That isn't going to change the structure by itself. But if we all did it, as they do in Ireland, and a third of the money in the system was kept in locally controlled credit unions, perhaps we wouldn't have had the banking crisis in the first place. So, how do we take things further? And it struck me as interesting that Paul was talking about the people in London that make decisions, and Lisa and John were both talking about making devolution work. And I believe that's what we've got to do. So I've responded to the a request from Joe Anderson, along with my Liberal Democrat colleagues across the Liverpool City region, to say we will work with you to make the Liverpool City region work. And I believe that we've got to approach this as if we were a city-state. 1.75 million people, three universities, one of the best ports in the world, all sorts of brilliant companies here, a great spirit, the GDP and a population the size of Northern Ireland, which has its own parliament, a GDP and population bigger than half the member countries of the Commonwealth, as a meeting at which I was at last week. Just imagine if we were to say we're not continually going to go with the begging bowl to London, or Brussels for that matter, we are going to take power in our own hands. We are going to create our own businesses. We are going to make sure that our money circulates around each other. We're going to make that city region, which is a boring bunch of men in suits at the moment, an exciting place that everyone in Liverpool will want to back. Well, I believe that that's possible, and it depends what question you ask. If you went into the pub next door and said, would you really like a major realignment of the governmental forces in the UK to restructure power down to Liverpool, most people would say, what's he on about? But if you said, do you think it right that there's a load of 30-year-olds with first-class honours degrees uh, from Oxbridge making decisions about your life, in fact, making more decisions than the mayor and the council do. Do you think that's right? And what will they say in the pub? That's bloody wrong. <laughs> and that's how to involve people, by asking them the right questions, by being relevant to them and exciting them. And it may surprise you to hear me say this, that I believe the city-region deal could be the best thing that's ever happened to us. Whether it is or it isn't, we just damn well got to make it work. And that's my pledge, to work together with the Labour Party, with the Greens, with anyone else, to make the Liverpool city region, the state of Liverpool, a powerful place where we can create wealth and share it in the right way. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.